Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm good, Nathan. I'm excited. How are you? I'm excited too. I just opened the notes for this episode right before we went live and skimming through it. I'm excited. And uh, the viewers on YouTube know why. It's because we got a special guest today. So I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, let's go. Um, if you'd like to find out more about one of the largest and most lucrative niches in copywriting, today's show is just for you. Supplement copy is that niche. And our guest today is an expert on writing copy and building offers for health supplements. Steve Earl has written copy for some of the best known names in the business. His clients include New Market Health, Dr. Al Sears, Pure Health Research, Biotrust, and many others. Now, supplement companies can grow very quickly. Steve has a skincare and pet brand as his client that has grown from $5 million to $100 million in the last four years with his help, of course. Steve's been writing copy full-time for about eight years, and he recently started a couple of business activities he'll tell you about later, mentoring and a newsletter, uh, actually daily email newsletter on supplement copy, which may be of interest to you if you decide to get deeper into this part of copywriting yourself. Today, Steve's going to walk us through some of his most important experiences and lessons to give you an idea of what the world of writing supplement copy is really like. But first, let me walk you through this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear in this podcast, and most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, or business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Steve, welcome. I understand you're coming to us from sunny Barcelona, Spain. How did you end up there? Hey, David. Yeah, glad, glad to be here. Um, I ended up here... Largely because of, of, of copy. Uh, before I get into copywriting, uh, way way back, I, I went through a, a, a rough time, kind of a crisis time in life, and everyone in my life told me, I, uh, if anyone needs a vacation, it's me, and uh, decided to come out to Barcelona. It's always, it had always been on my bucket list. Came here, and it just uh, I don't, the city healed me. The city's really got a great personality, and I decided very quickly that I was going to find a way to live here and i went back home with a few promises to myself one of those was to quit my job another one was to uh learn a new skill that could pay me online and uh sure enough that was uh, how i headed down the path into into a few different things and then eventually eventually copy and i've always been drawn to trying to make a career as a as a writer which i didn't believe you could unless you were famous or you know sold a novel and uh came across copywriting and and sure enough, I was just sucked right in from, you know, old those old classic sales letters to books to, you know, working with with mentors and then writing my own copy. It just uh, kind of snowballed after that. And as soon as I had enough, um, uh, I wouldn't say I had enough money in the bank, as soon as I had something in the bank and, and a couple of clients, I, I hopped on a plane and, and came out here and I've been here ever since. Yeah, I mean, you're living a lot of people's dream, I think, and, and it's, it's great to know that it's possible. So, you know, today you offered to walk us through three of your most important experiences and lessons um, to give us an idea of what the world of writing supplement copy is like. Still up for that? That sounds good? Yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. I, I think the first one, you sent in some copy. Maybe maybe it was a VSL or, or a sales letter. I'm not sure. And it came back after a few weeks. And why don't you take it from there? Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it was one of my first big big boy jobs with uh, with one of the eight hundred pound gorillas of of supplement and financial copywriting, and uh, I didn't I didn't know what I didn't know, and I was brought on to I was recommended by my mentor um, to to write some copy for them, and I was brought on for a a VSL script. I think it was for a bone health supplement, or it might have been a brain health, one of the two. Uh, anyways, uh, working with their copy chief, you know, really great people. Um, they, they want you to succeed. They, they give you all the tools. They give you a lot of research, and they kind of give you an outline of of what you can and can't say. And I thought, great, I'm, I'm not going to say anything crazy anyways. And 
uh, went ahead and wrote the promo with, with the help of my mentor, um, you know, went through the, the proper channels with them and submitting a lead and getting that approved and all that good stuff. And, uh, and then uh, it kind of went silent after about, after maybe two weeks after I had submitted it and I hadn't heard anything. And then finally I get, I get my copy back uh, with all these, uh, all these red lines and crossed out lines and changes and comments and, um, just, just basically torn to, torn to shreds and not, not from a particularly copy point of view. Um, all the comments were from two or three lawyers, which was the first time that I had, I had ever experienced that. Not, uh, not directly from the copy chief, which is what I was expecting, but a lot of comments on what I can say, what I can't say, why I can't say this, where's your, you know, your substantiation for this. And I'm thinking substantiation. I mean, I researched this and I have some links in there, but so uh, really nitpicky stuff, uh, and it just kind of blew my mind that that this was a whole other type of review that I wasn't wasn't prepared for <laughs> at all. Yeah, the uh, the c word, right? Compliance. Compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that Definitely. c word. But it wasn't all bad, right? I mean, it it was painful, but it it actually there were you got some benefit out of it too after you finished licking your wounds and got up off the floor and put the bottles of wine away or whatever. Yeah, no, it, 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 it was a bit of a, a kick in the stomach because it was a lot of rewriting that had to be done and a lot of substantiation, like I mentioned, that had to be done. And, and like I said, lucky, I, I had a, a fantastic uh, mentor who kind of walked me through that and, uh, you know, got a lot of those changes made. Um, you know, and we're talking three, four weeks later of changes, submitting, resubmitting, getting it back, dealing with legal speak, asking what this means, a little bit frustrating at times, but getting it back and finally getting it submitted, uh, approved and then approved to actually for them to, to run traffic to it. And it did, it did okay. Uh, it came, it came, it came out of the gate and I think it was, was ahead of their control, um, by a little bit, which, which was another lesson that I learned when I, I heard that it had beaten the control. I, I thought I had a winner on my hands and then they, they politely explained to me, no, we don't, we don't consider it a new control until you've gotten a 20% bump on the previous control. Oh. And I, I hadn't, I hadn't quite hit that. I hadn't quite quit hit that measure and was a bit deflated, but once again, going back to a, having a great mentor, just, um, just gives you, you know, so many, you have someone in your corner, right? Explaining to you like, Hey, you didn't hit a home run, but you had a base hit You're on base. It's not bad. And they'll probably bring you around for another, another crack at it or another crack at another promo. So that was great. And they did sure enough, uh, you know, after I, I stopped feeling sorry for myself, uh, I, I ended up getting another promo with the same, the same client, um, same deal, different, uh, offer. And, uh, this time I thought I would, I'd outsmart them. You know, I, I've been through the whole process and I'm, you know, I want to get paid quicker this time. I don't want to have to wait weeks and weeks and weeks. So I'm going to, I'm going to write this, this piece with, you know, compliance in mind. I'm going to go through everything the, the lawyers told me before and re rewrite this one, the most compliant version I can possibly do. And that ended up being one of the larger, one of the larger mistakes I made early on in my career was trying to write for compliance instead of for conversion with compliance in mind. And those are two very, very different things. And That's gold. But um, and unless someone's been been through this labyrinth, I'm not sure they'll understand the difference. Could could you really break it down the difference between writing for compliance or writing for conversion with compliance in mind? Yeah. So the, the first one, let's start with the first one. The first one is writing for compliance, which is, which is what I did. I, I wrote, I wrote the copy and then I, you know, neutered myself, so to speak, trying to write it in the most compliant way possible so that the lawyers would be happy and they wouldn't send me back another revision, you know, another revised piece with hundreds and hundreds of comments and, and lines crossed out and you can't say this. And okay. I, can, that, can I, yeah. can I, so you were trying to be perfect. You were trying to avoid, avoid all conflict as opposed mm -hmm. to what? What you learned As later. opposed to, yeah, as opposed to writing for conversion, writing for the customer, writing to their, like, you know, their big promise, their benefit, their problem to get them to actually buy the product that's going to solve their problem, which is my job with what I'd been hired for as a, as a copywriter. 
Um, I instead tried to, you know, finagle it so that I wouldn't get any 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 hot water, so to speak, with the with the legal team and get the copy approved right out of the gate so I can get that nice that nice final paycheck as quickly as possible. Because when you're a new copywriter starting out, you're trying to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that was a mistake because uh, I submitted what I thought was a really, really compliant version. And that's when I learned a new lesson because sure enough, two weeks later, uh, it came back with red lines again, with all kinds of cross out and changes. And that's when, uh, once again, my, my fantastic mentor uh, gave me another piece of advice. He said, you know, your job as a copywriter is, is like I said, to write, write for conversion and write for the sale. And, and that's what you've been hired for. The lawyer, who, by the way, is being paid much more than you are, they've been hired to make sure that nothing gets out the door, nothing gets run that's going to put the client at risk in terms of the FDA, in terms of things you can't say, in terms of you know claims that can't be substantiated. So if you submit a piece of copy that is completely neutered in terms of, of, of what you might think legal is going to say yes or no to, the it's not like the lawyers are going to come back and just say nothing. They got to earn their keep as well. They have to at least appear like they've been doing their job. So if you send them watered down copy, they're going to dump a whole bunch of more water on it and water it down further. And it's just going to take you further away from that conversion, which is your, your goal. And that's when I, I kind of figured out that I should be writing for conversion with compliance in mind which is what I try and teach a lot of new copywriters in the supplement world to do, um, you know, right to the best of your ability, right for that conversion. Even if you know the copy you're currently writing is probably a little bit across the line, you can always scale that back later. You're, you're trying to write the best possible headline, hook, lead, close that you can, and then go back knowing what you know about compliance, make your revisions and submit it even if you know it's a little bit across the line, that was a great piece of advice I got. If you know it's a little bit across the line, the lawyers are gonna smack it back anyways, and they're gonna tell you where, where that line has to be. Let them do their job because you've gotta do your job. That's really good advice, and th thank you for breaking that down. I appreciate that. So a little bit across the line doesn't mean leaving out documentation or footnotes or, no it, no, it means making the claims a little bolder, maybe being a little more absolute than you're actually allowed to mm -hmm. what, say, things like that, right? Yeah, really, you know, pushing, pushing the envelope, which is what marketers do. It's what we're hired to do is to try and push that envelope within, within reason. You know, we're, we're not out there promising cures and, and, and life-changing results in, in two days. Um, you know, not to say that that isn't out there in the market. Um, unfortunately, it is. And, and that's just the world that we live in. Not everybody plays by the rules, but certainly the, the, the larger players in the market, um, the Agoras of the world and, and those kind of clients, um, they've got a big target on their back, especially now. And, and they want to make sure things are compliant. And at the same time, they, they want to make sure that they're, they're promising things to their customers that the product can deliver on. That's probably the most important thing is you, you don't want to say something that the product can't deliver on because if they buy it for that reason and it doesn't deliver on that, you end up with an unhappy customer who charges back or refunds it or worse, never buys from you again. Okay. So um, I guess the entire economy kind of took a, a dip during the pandemic, but uh, I'm I'm seeing signs. Well, has nothing to do with uh, uh, supplements, but it might in in an overall general trend sense. I I read a story this morning on my phone that a uh, city where I'm in, San Francisco, is starting to come back because of AI. Billions of dollars and and jobs are are pouring into the city because of this huge expansion. Now, we could and we have had a lot of long argument about whether that's good or not but nevertheless uh, my, my my point is not whether it's good or not it, it's that the economy seems to be on an upswing inflation seems to be inching down all kinds of things what about the supplement market what's going on with you know uh supplement companies marketing of supplements things like that well i mean what are you seeing big picture i i do want to talk about your two opportunities but let's talk sure. about the the landscape of the uh, marketplace first. I, 
I think it's that for me, even though I've been doing this for, for 10 years, which you know, to some people isn't that long, long of a time and to others, it's a, it's an eternity. Um, I think it's never been a better time to get involved with supplement copy or to be in that business or to have offers in that, in that business, because since the pandemic, uh, especially in the health and supplement market, there has been what I'm seeing as a, as a, as a paradigm shift since that happened. I mean, there were already trends uh, before the pandemic of, of people, particularly millennials, but even, even the, the Gen Xers and, and the boomers taking their health into their hands a little bit more. But the pandemic really was that paradigm shift of two things. First, um, you've got to be responsible for your own health. I mean, I think a lot of people really woke up to, you know, the people that were most at risk during during that that awful pandemic. I can't imagine why someone would think they're not supposed to be. Well, I, I can't imagine why. It's because of the way we're brought up. You go to the doctor, you listen mm -hmm. to the doctor, you don't question the doctor, you comply with the doctor, then you get sick again and you re <laughs> repeat the cycle, yeah. right? Cycle, yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, but so that's, the, saying, that's the first thing. But the, but the marketplace is changing is what you're saying. And this creates a huge opportunity for alternative health, right? I, a huge opportunity for alternative health. People are, are looking at that a lot more about taking their health into their own hands. And then the second thing that also accelerates that, like gasoline on the fire, is I don't think there's ever been a lower level of trust in pharma. Not that there was before, but even more so now. Everything everything that went on during the pandemic, and we don't, we don't need to litigate that. There's plenty of that online still. Um, you know, whatever your, your opinions are on that stuff, it's pretty clear that, you know, there's a there's a loss of trust in those institutions, doctors as well. Not that I would ever recommend anybody doesn't listen or have a good relationship with their doctor. They should. Um, but there's low levels of trust there. There's low levels of trust with the government and and, and pharma in particular. And I think that's are, pushing. Are a there, lot of are there lower levels? This is this is really huge in terms of marketing. Are there lower levels of trust with doc, people's own doctors than there used to be? I'm seeing that anecdotally. I don't, I don't have any data to, to, to back that up. I see that anecdotally with 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 my own parents. Right? They they're annoyed with they're in Canada, so there's a lot of long wait times in Canada with the with the healthcare system. Um, they get annoyed that they show up, they wait forever for their doctor, they talk to the doctor for three minutes, and they're out of the, out of the office with a with a prescription. I mean, that's yeah. kind of always been the case over over the last twenty years, but I just think that, you know the pandemic accelerated that, and there's it's driven more and more people to looking at natural alternatives with the understanding that. Uh, Maybe these aren't going to work as fast as some of the drugs, but they don't come with the same side effects. And I can kind of it can kind of help me lead a, a healthier life. I'm seeing that a, a lot. I'm seeing a lot more interest in that. So I think it's a great time to be a supplement copywriter because a lot of these bigger companies have have caught on to that trend and they want to sell great products with without making crazy claims. You know, they want to be able to bring someone in the front door with with, uh, you know, more of a subdued claim that they can actually deliver on and then convert that person on the back end through their other products in their catalog. I'm seeing a lot more of that sort of what people are calling, I guess, branded DR is kind of a hot buzz term, but it really just means, you know, treating your customers a lot, a lot better than just a cash machine. Yeah. I'm going to jump in real quick and say I, and this is anecdotal, anecdotal as well. I have two family members and a really good friend that are all working in the medical industry, two of them nurses and one of them a doctor. And they say that even in their own profession, trust in the industry is way down right now. And looking at alternative solutions is something that's very popular, even inside of the medical industry. Oh, uh, yeah, do, you, so. do, do you mean that, um, they're they're not trusting big pharma as much as they used to when you say the industry is that what you mean big pharma absolutely yeah people are looking for alternatives to big pharma we, we may be on to something here and i don't think we're the ones who discovered it but i mean if if there were a trend that would really make supplement marketing and therefore copywriting gigs for supplements bigger than it was this would be that trend in my opinion mm -hmm. It's it's one of them. There's one other trend that I've been watching more in the online world that, that kind of comes down to, to marketing as well. That's also accelerating it is, um, you know, a couple years ago, three, four years ago, maybe you're, maybe the, your listeners um, aren't, aren't totally aware. There's a there's a bit of a difference between, uh, you know, direct response marketers and your traditional e-com marketers, the way 
you know, direct response funnel works compared to your more generic e-com funnel. Not that, not that one is better than the other. There's just different tactics involved. And for a long time, I noticed the, the, the e-commerce, you know, guys and girls, um, didn't really know much about those, those direct response tactics, or maybe even viewed them as spammy or scammy and just didn't understand them. That's certainly not the case over the last couple of years. They have really, um, caught on to, I start seeing, I start seeing all these, uh, you know, CBD brands that are e-com or supplement brands that are e-com that are moving much more towards, um, you know, instead of just driving from a Facebook ad to their product page or their checkout page, they're, they're starting to mix in advertorials. They're really starting to segment their list, their email list properly and, and take advantage of daily emailing or, or three or four times a week. Whereas three, four years ago, if I had an e-com client knocking at the door and I told them they should email every day, they almost hung up on me. They, they just didn't, they just didn't get that side of the game. And now they really, they really do. So that's another advantage to people who want to get into supplement copy is there's a wider, a wider ocean of, of clients to go after. That's really good. And would you say um, that the content of their emails is changing, is becoming more conversational, more benefit oriented, more like a, a, a relaxed, trusted sales, trusted environment sales talk? Yeah, I, I'm seeing them mix. They, they still want to mix in their, the, the branded stuff. They want to have, you know, the nice images and have the product look nice. But I'm seeing more and more of them mix in, you know, just the, the white background, plain text emails that drive to a link at the bottom, which is as simple as it's ever been. I, I, I don't know. I, I, need to, I need to take my big pharma heart medication. Did you say they're sending out emails that that, that look like emails? Yeah, they just <laughs> they look like just regular plain text emails. They, I think a, a lot of the I see a lot of chatter from some you know, guys that are that are that guys and girls that are much younger um, and been in this game less than I have that have done some amazing things. And I see them share share tactics of like you know plain emails convert better because it conveys one simple message. It pushes them towards one call to action and and it actually gets delivered better because there's not all these images and it doesn't set off all the spam filters. You know, email copy, uh, it definitely there's, there's a lot of guys and girls doing email copy um, sort of in that direct response way um, with, a, with a branding twist on it. Certainly advertorials, which was really uh, kind of a direct response only thing for, for a while. I, I remember just a few years ago meeting marketers and saying the word advertorial. That, what, what's that? You mean an editorial? You mean an ad? They didn't really know what it was. And now more and more people they know what an advertorial is, a listicle is. Like, they, they, they've got really interesting you know, interactive designs for them. So I think right now the time is ripe if you want to get into direct response uh, supplement marketing. Um, there's just another side. It doesn't have to be like the, the huge direct response mailers who generally look for heavy hitters and really experienced writers and don't don't tend to hire a lot of juniors. Um, whereas some of these other brands are more than willing to take a chance on someone who's who's green but can learn their products and, and come in on maybe a smaller retainer and work their way up. I'm seeing a lot a lot more of that, which is exciting. Well, good. So that's a perfect time to transition to talking about how you're helping people with this. Um, you've you've got a, a couple of things that you do. You've got a newsletter, and mm -hmm. I think occasionally you mentor people as well. Could you? Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. No, I, I, I recently kind of kicked off a, a little bit of a, of a newsletter, just noticing people are responding well to some of the, the content I put out there. And, and one of the one of the reasons why I want, launched the newsletter goes back to what we were talking about with, um, you know, supplement companies who maybe don't play by the rules in terms of compliance. And it's something that's been on my mind for a couple of years now where I really, it sounds like a big crazy goal, but I really do want to play a part in changing the industry that I work in. Unfortunately, there's a side of the market that, you know, they, they don't want to sell great products and they want to make crazy claims and, and really just make as much money as they, as they can. And you know, I'm all capitalizing on people making money, but I also want to see people get the help they need and, and good products get sold. Um, and I want to, do my part to, you know, guide copywriters towards writing that kind of copy that's compliant, that's well researched, that's good marketing that you you can say, look, I'm 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 proud of this. I remember early in my career when I was trying to pay the bills, taking some of those jobs from the, the less than scrupulous marketers out there. And I remember, you know, when my my mother would ask, 
you know, let, let me see your writing. What's what's going what's going on with your career? Being a little bit embarrassed about about showing her some of that stuff, and that's why you know one of the rules I take in in my in my profession now is I I, I want to make sure the products that I write for for supplements particularly pass the the mother test. Like would I would I give this to my mother and expect her to get a result and be safe? Uh, if it does, then that's something that I'm interested in, in in writing for and and doing the best marketing possible. So I really would uh, like to start mentoring uh, individuals, and I, and I already do. I already have a couple of, of cubs that uh, that I mentor and, and help uh, you know find clients, ha- help really learn the craft, which is the the big thing that gets forgotten so much online. On, online, you see that that sexy headline of you know here's how you can make ten thousand dollars a month without any experience. Um, you know, and sure enough, a copywriter wrote that because they know that's the desire of the of the of the market. Um, but it's 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 you really do have to um, own your craft and you really do have to work at it. And when you get good at it, it's it's not as hard as everybody thinks it is. It's not it's not rocket science. It's it's marketing. And if you can really understand human psychology and, and how to research, you can really have an edge over a lot of the other writers in the market and do really good work. And then it becomes I don't want to say easy, but it becomes um, you know, a lot easier to go out and find clients who are willing to pay you the big bucks because you can deliver a result as you spent that time working on your on your craft. And that's not to say you need to to work only on your craft and not work on work on client work until you're quote unquote ready. Um, it, there's a way to do both. There's a way to you know test your copy in the market and get better at the same time. And that's kind of where I want to lead. Um, you know, the next generation of copywriters, because that's what my mentor, you know, did for me. He really pushed me in the right direction and, and yeah. cut years off my learning curve. Yeah, I, I, I know your mentor. He's a great guy, good friend of mine, too. Your newsletter is called what? It's the SUPS Copy Chief at SUPSCopyChief.com, S-U-P-P-S, CopyChief.com. Um, and people can sign up very low fee. I, I, I do charge for it. Um, another lesson I learned from my mentor was when you tend to pay for things, you tend to follow that advice uh, a lot more. And at the same time, it's a motivator for me because I have people that are paying for a service, uh, which is a small fee for my newsletter. Uh, so it forces me to really think about the content that I'm, I'm putting out to those subscribers that they're getting the best of it and not just throwing up any random thought in my head and, and making an email about it, but actually thinking about how can they use this in their business today and, and, and then discuss it with me perhaps on a, on a call because I do offer, I do offer calls uh, as, as included in the, in the newsletter. If anyone wants to get on a call and have a quick chat about where they're at, I'm, I'm always more than happy to do that because if I, if I didn't have that when I was starting out, I, I probably would have spun my wheels for, for a good half decade before, before figuring things out. So you kind of just, you want to pass it on and you want to help people. And I think uh, if, if more of us did that, then, then we would be able to affect some serious change in the, in the industry. I, I hope so. I mean, the one thing I'm thinking about is, yes, one person can make a difference and you can be that person, but sociopaths going to sociopath. That's just what they <laughs> Very do. Very true. You know, Very true. Yeah. They're, they're like a part of the human genome or something like that. So that's, that's not entirely going to change, but it could become maybe smaller or more easier to identify. Um, mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll put your links in the uh, show notes, which are Steve, I want to say thank you for coming on, man. This was an awesome episode. I really liked the beginning part when you were talking about compliance. It reminded me of the saying, write drunk, edit sober, write for (laughs) conversions and edit for compliance, man. Great message. And uh, before we're out of here, if people do want to follow up with you, what's one more time, let us know where people can find out how to get in touch with you. Uh, They can find me on Twitter at SupsCopyChief. Uh, on Twitter. And then uh, my newsletter is pretty much the same thing, just supscopychief.com. And uh, they can sign up for the newsletter there. Or, you know, I give away lots of free uh, information and tips on on Twitter too, whatever's kind of on the top of my head. So it's a great place to learn and connect with people. Nice. All right. So if you're listening and you need the show notes, because we'll have all of the links there, copywriterspodcast.com is the best place to go. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later. Thanks, guys.